Well, thanks uh, to everybody who's serving around here to, to make this happen. The worship team, the tech team, people taking care of the food, checking us in. Um, love to see the body of Christ at work and moving and serving and, and to see so many young people that are engaged in helping out. That is a beautiful thing. That's exactly the way it should be. So praise the Lord for that. Um, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 3. So I have two more lessons I'm going to be sharing with you. And um, I'm going to do half of it from Ephesians 3, uh, uh, 1 through 13 uh, right now. And then we'll pick up the other half later. And so what I hope to do, this is, um, this is a, the way in which I'm going to approach teaching the word here is going to be just to read the text, try to understand that what the, the scripture is saying, kind of define it, um, then we're going to begin to try and make application to our life. And so I, I pray that this will be an encouragement to you. Um, I plan to share some, some experiences that, um, I, from my own life, from the ministry, and hopefully you can find a way to connect that with your own heart and your own life. But let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, your truth. We ask that you would speak to our hearts through your word. Lord, you've spoken to our hearts through the words that we just sang, uh, the truth of scripture that we declared, Lord. Our hearts are full. Our minds are set upon the kingdom. We're set upon being with you. We are reminded, Lord, as we sing these songs of where we came from, where we are now. Lord, we give you glory. We give you honor. And now we pray, Lord, speak to our hearts in the name of Jesus. Amen. So turn with me there to Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going to pick up at verse 1, and the title of the study is Endurance in Ministry. Endurance in Ministry. Now, some of you are thinking, well, I'm not a pastor, I'm not an evangelist, so this doesn't relate to me. No, it relates to you, because every believer, every follower of Jesus Christ has been given ministry. You have been given a, a task from the Lord to fulfill. And we'll talk more about that as we go. But this title, Endurance in Ministry, is for the servant of the Lord who works a full-time job out there in the, the regular world. It's for uh, the, the pastor, the full-time minister. So, Endurance in Ministry. As we move into chapter 3, of course, we've skipped over chapters 1 and 2. And in chapter 2, Paul is talking about the great promises that have been made available to Gentiles. So you have the Jews, those that are the physical descendants of Abraham, and then you have the rest of the world. And um, most of us in here fit into the rest of the world category. We were and are Gentiles. But in chapter 2, Paul is writing to them and he's talking to these Gentiles and he says, the Lord has brought you into the family. The Lord has brought you into the covenants and the promises that were for the nation of Israel. They're yours now. And so he's talking all about this ministry that had been committed to him to go and preach to the Gentiles and to let them know that the door is open to them. If you could maybe think about it like this. There, imagine that you had traveled all the way over to Israel. And this, before the Lord come, before Jesus had come. And you wanted to go because you heard that the God of Israel is the God of the universe. And you want to worship him. And as you came there, and you approached, you would have gone to the temple, you would have approached there, but you would have found that you weren't allowed to go very far. As a Gentile, I wouldn't have been able to go very far. I would have been able to make it into the court of the Gentiles, but we know from what we read in the Gospels that at the, in the days and ministry of Jesus, the court of the Gentiles, where the, uh, those that are not Jewish, they allowed to come, that had been turned into a place where there was buying and selling and thievery taking place. So you would have come there. And as you would have gone and wanted to approach further where the rest of the crowd was coming, you would have seen a sign that said, no Gentile can pass this point. And if you do, you're dead. It's your, 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 if you go past that point right there, 
But if you were able somehow to get lost in the crowd and you were to go past, you would have seen this other structure on the Temple Mount. And that's where only a few men would have been going in. That's where the table of showbread, that's where the, the altar of incense, this is where the, 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 the candlesticks were that illuminated the room. And then you would have noticed there was another room, the Holy of Holies, but nobody was going in there except for one man once a year. And so what you would have noticed as you approached was that there was a barrier in the court of the Gentiles. And then there was another barrier going into the holy place. And there was another barrier going into the most holy place. Now, you would have been welcome to worship the God of Israel, and you could have converted and become a, a, you know, one that was of the Jewish faith, but all along the way, you saw that there were obstacles that kept you from coming very close. But when Jesus Christ died on the cross, what happened? As he hung on the cross, and as his body was being torn apart, what happened in the temple? The veil in the temple was ripped wide open from top to bottom, signifying that the way into the most holy place is now available to all, to all Jews who couldn't go there, but also to all Gentiles. And that's what Paul's been talking about. The door has been swung wide open. There's no more limitation. Come on in. You are now a partaker of the covenants and the promises of God. You didn't have access, but now you've been brought near. Let me just read a couple of verses there in Ephesians 2, verse 11, uh, down to verse 13. Maybe a little bit further. But it says, Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called the uncircumcision, but what, by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, you were without the Messiah. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And so the writer of Hebrews says, draw near with a full heart of insurance, uh, assurance. There is no more barrier. You get to come close. Now here we are 2,000 years later, and we don't even give that a second thought. But there was a time in the history of the church when this truth was being revealed and they were understanding it. And that's where we are. We're in the midst of controversy as you're in chapter two and chapter three. We read chapter two and it's just good news. But in the day in which Paul wrote chapter two and chapter three, it was controversial. How controversial was it? We're going to read in just a moment. It was so controversial that it landed him in jail for years because he wanted to tell people. He wanted to tell me. He wanted to tell you. He wanted to tell the Gentile world. You are welcome to come close to Jesus. And there was a certain group of the Jews who didn't want anything to do with that. It angered them and it made them mad. We'll come back to that later. But this is where we are. He's talking about this amazing access that we have now that once we did not have. And he's writing about this as he sits in prison because he preached that message. That's where we find ourselves as we move into chapter 3. So let's read chapter 3, verse 1. For this reason, what reason? Well, chapter 2. Everything we just talked about. For this reason, I, Paul the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written already. Chapter 2, that's the briefly written part. Verse 4, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So we see the word mystery. Mystery is not an enigma that cannot be understood. A mystery in the biblical sense is a truth that was previously unknown. There's no mystery. We can refer to it, it was a mystery. What's the mystery? Oh, that the Gentiles were going to have the same equal access into the presence and the covenant and the promises of God. That mystery, he says, I've made known to you this mystery, verse 5, which in other ages was not made known. 
to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, verse 9, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, that we would see the fellowship of the mystery, from which, which from the beginning of the ages had been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore, I ask you, do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. I'm in jail because I'm telling the world, the Gentile world, you can now come. That Jesus has made the way open. That has landed me in jail. This is why I'm suffering. And so one of the first points I want to talk about as we look at chapter 3 is just this, this simple little phrase, for this reason. So chapter 3, verse 1, this little phrase, for this reason. The reason is everything I just talked about. It's everything that's in chapter 2. That we are welcomed by God through Jesus Christ into the most holy place to dwell with him, to have access with him. And he said, he's going to go on and talk about that. It's that reason why he has been put in jail. One might think that after so many imprisonments, after so many beatings, after so much rejection, after so much hardship, after so much hunger, after so much sleeplessness, after so much uh, you know, difficulties just trying to get around the world and preach this message, that Paul might back off a little bit. That he might say, ah, this is a little bit much. But why? What, what would cause a man like Paul, to be hungry and to be beaten and to end up in jail and to go through everything that he did. And here's, here's a point. We can make a few points, but here's one that I want you to hear. Because he esteemed, he valued the unity of the body of Christ. He valued that. And so although this crowd was going to be yelling at him and saying, don't have anything to do with the Gentiles, Paul would say, I have to have something to do with the Gentiles. I value what God has done. And what God has done is he is creating a new body of believers. You know, when Paul traveled into uh, Jerusalem with this message, he'd been preaching it throughout Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. And he'd been preaching this message and he came to Jerusalem and he met with some of the leaders in the church in Jerusalem. They're like, Paul, the Jews here really, really hate you. They want to do you harm. They want, to, they want to kill you. So I've got an idea. We have a couple of men that have taken a vow, a Nazarite vow. And it's time for them to go to the temple and to make the offerings. We think that if you will pay for them to go in and make these offerings, then the rest of the Jews who hate you and because you're preaching to the Gentiles, when they see this, they're going to be okay. They're going to be all right with it. Now, Paul, the whole way he'd been traveling, so keep a finger there in Ephesians. Turn over to Acts chapter 20 with me. Acts chapter 20, 21, and really through the rest of the book of Acts, that is the context, that's the history for Paul being a prisoner. So if you want to know how did he end up in prison, Start reading in Acts 20 and keep on reading to the end of the book of Acts and you'll see that. But in Acts uh, 20, one of the things that we see is that everywhere he goes, he's being told, there's bad things waiting for you, Paul. When you get to Jerusalem, they're going to arrest you. 
They're going to throw you into jail. And so I want to read just a portion of that. Uh, Acts 20 verse, um, let's pick up at, well, it's verse 17. For, Mil- for Miletus, he sent to the uh, Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you know from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you. You know that I, I lived an honorable life. Serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. How I kept nothing that was helpful. I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying the chains and the tribulations await me. Now look at verse 24. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I might finish my race with joy and and the ministry which I've received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. This was his calling, was to be a light to the Gentiles, to bring this gospel. And he says, I'm going back to Jerusalem And it's in Jerusalem that he's going to get arrested. And it's eventually in that arrest that he writes the book of Ephesians. Okay, so this is is the context of it all. This is the background of it all. And as he's journeying to Jerusalem, everywhere people are saying, bad news. And even the Spirit is saying, you're going to be arrested. Which would have turned most people away. Well, if I'm going to Kenya and I'm going to be arrested... Maybe I'm not going to Kenya this time. Maybe I'll wait till the next trip to go to Kenya. I don't think I want to be in any jail. I certainly don't want to be in a jail outside of my country. So I don't know that I'm going. This would be a thought that a lot of us would have. If you go to that village and you preach the gospel there one more time, they're going to kill you. They're going to burn your your house down. They're coming for your family. You would pause and think, do I really want to go? But what does Paul say? I appreciate your love for me, but actually, these dangers, these troubles, they don't move me off my calling. They don't make me move to the left. They don't make me move to the right. The Lord has called me to preach, and I'm going to go preach. I'm not going to stop. It doesn't move me. And it's so, and back in Ephesians, he says, for this reason, I'm a prisoner. And he knew he was going to be a prisoner before he became a prisoner. And he just looked at it and he said, I'm all in. I'm all in. Now, as, you, as we keep on looking in this chapter, you find out that he goes into Jerusalem. He pays for that Nazarite vow. It doesn't work. False accusations are made against him and saying that he's bringing Gentiles into the past the court of the Gentiles. It's not true, but this is what they were saying. They arrested him. They're ready to kill him. In uh, uh, Acts 21... Picking up at verse 26, you can read there and you see that Paul began to speak to uh, his countrymen and um, they are not happy and he has to be rescued. Into chapter 22, verses 21 and 22, it says, uh, excuse me, not 21, um, chapter 22, yeah, at verse 20, and he says, and when... The blood of your martyr Stephen was shed. I also standing by, consenting to his death. So he's he's at the end of his message and guarding his clothes to those who were killing. Then he said to me, depart for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. And they listened to him until the word, this word, what word? Gentile. And they couldn't, they listened to everything he had to say. But just the fact that he said, I've been sent to the Gentiles, the crowd loses their mind. They begin to grab at him. And and the Romans have to come down and they have to rescue Paul. That's the beginning of his imprisonment. He knew he was going to be in prison. The Spirit was telling him. But he says, that doesn't move me. There's his imprisonment. So back in Ephesians chapter 3, says, for this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, now you know 
all that's loaded in that one little verse. All kinds of chapters written around this. He's condensing the story. But again, back to that point I made, when you know there's certain trouble for doing ministry a certain way that the Lord has called you to do it, maybe you would be tempted to know, well, if I do it this way and I go there again, I'm going to be thrown in jail. You might say, well, I'm not going to do that anymore. But that's not Paul's mentality. Because he knows that the body of Christ, Jew and Gentile, have been brought together in one new man. He esteemed this unity that we have. God has not designed the church nor the believer to function on their own. Aren't you glad that the Lord did this? Aren't you glad in that, you know, wherever town, wherever village you are, aren't you glad that you have like-minded brothers and sisters that love Jesus and want to worship Jesus and they want to pray together and that you could reach out to them and they would encourage you? I am so glad that we don't do this by ourselves, but that the Lord formed the church and Paul esteemed this and he valued this. You know, back in Ephesians chapter 2, at verse 14, we read, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. So Jew and Gentile, he's brought peace, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, Jew and Gentile together, a third race, right, if you will. It's the church. And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the what? What does it say? Look at there. Chapter 16, uh, verse 2, verse 16. He is going to make them together to God in one body through the what? The cross. Oh, we know. All of us know this. We know that Jesus hung on the cross and he died for our sins. That my guilt and my shame was laid on his body and he was crucified for me that I might be saved, that I might have atonement. But do you know this, what we just read? Do you know that? Do you, do you know that Jesus died on the cross for a second reason? It isn't just to save me and to take me to heaven. He died on the cross for a second reason. What is that reason? To bring us together as one new man. One of the problems that happened in the church, the early church, it has happened in every church throughout the history of the world, is this thing, called, I'm sure in Kenya, you don't have this problem, but it's called church division. You don't have that problem here, do you? Oh, you do have that, okay. So, and, and personalities come out, and people begin to fight, and we begin to talk about each other, and the body of Christ is divided because I've been offended. They hurt my feelings, they, they trampled on an area that I go and evangelize. He knows I evangelize there. Why did he go there? I'm done with him. And we divide the body of Christ. But let me ask you, do you really want to divide what Jesus hung on the cross to unite? Did you hear that? Do you want to divide what Jesus hung on the cross to unite? You see, church division is not just our politics. Church division is, is, is fighting against the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That changes the whole story now, doesn't it? Because I don't want to undermine what the Lord has done. And Paul knows this. He's writing about it. And so he says, I have a, he doesn't say it directly, but it's in the text. I esteem the church of Jesus Christ and the unity of, and if me preaching to Gentiles is going to get me in trouble with the Jews, then I'll do it because the unity is too important. Listen, there are a lot of reasons why we can divide and argue. Now, if somebody is preaching another gospel and somebody is, is leading people astray or somebody is hurting and harming them, all right, we divide against that. But that's not the body of Christ. That's the work of Satan, okay? That's different. But if it's just that we have a different name or a different title or, you know, I went to this school, he went to that school, you know, she goes to this church and I go to that church, these are not reasons to divide. Listen, I'm sure we have our theological differences and the word of God is a final statement 
And if I need to alter my theological differences or approach to ministry because the Word of God tells me to, and you come and instruct me, then I need to receive that because it's from the Word of God. And the same goes for you and for all of us. But he esteemed the unity of the church. Don't ever fight against a brother or a sister to tear them down when Jesus hung on the cross to bring us together. I said it yesterday, and I know you've probably said this many times yourself, but Jesus said that the world would know that we are one because of our, our love. And I think you can easily put the, the idea and the concept of unity in there as well. We are to strive for the unity of the body of Christ because Jesus hung on the cross to bring us together. Don't despise one another. Don't belittle one another. Esteem one another. There's nothing that's more, uh, you know, hap- will make a parent happy than to see their children getting along. So I told you we had three kids, <laughs> and sometimes they fought, and they argued, and they bickered, and neither Rebecca nor myself ever enjoyed it. We never said, oh, isn't that a wonderful noise? Our children screaming and yelling and fighting. No, we never once enjoyed that. And so Rebecca or myself would come in, hey, knock it off. Well, she started, I don't care. I do not care who started this fight. I want there to be love and peace and unity. Now our children are older. And you know one thing that makes us so happy? was when we're talking to, they all live far away from us. That doesn't make us happy. That makes us sad. But one thing that makes us happy is when I'm talking to my son, and he'll say, yeah, I was just talking to my sister, Whitney, or I was just talking to Megan. Or Megan says, oh, I was just on the phone with with Whitney when you called and I hung up. I love that. As parents, we love that, don't we? And so my son's going down with his family to a birthday for this little one-year-old, cutest little girl ever. This little one-year-old, and he's going down to Sazis, and he's bringing his family down, they're getting together. Oh, that makes mom and dad so happy. Why? Because our family is together, and they're loving one another. Listen, we are the family, and we have to love one another. Sometimes love is giving a hard word. But getting angry and dividing is never right. So the first thing I want us to see here, and I realize it's taken me a long time to make this point, but Paul says, for this reason, I, Paul, for what reason? For the unity of the church. That's the reason. If his whole life and ministry was caught up on the bringing together the two men into one or or helping to see that happen because Jesus did it, then again, we don't want to be on the other side of that. The next point that we see, um, still in verse 1, we're flying through this passage. The next point, still in verse 1, for this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles. So he says that he's a prisoner of Rome. Is that what the text says? Who's he a prisoner of? Of Christ. He's a prisoner of Christ. Jesus locked him up and put him in jail? Well, No, it's Rome that did that. It's the Jews that were kind of working the political system to make sure that he got arrested. So he had all kinds of Jews. There's all kinds of Romans wanting payoffs, wanting bribes. And he had been in jail for years at this point when he's writing. And he says, I, Paul, a prisoner of those lousy Romans. Can't stand those Romans. They've taken advantage of me. It's because of those Jews that just can't see that Jesus is the Messiah. They're the ones that have put me there. And you know what it is? Do you know what it would have been if he would have said, I, Paul, a prisoner of those lousy Romans? I, Paul, a prisoner of those blind Jews? He would have been a victim. He would have been a victim. He would have been a victim of their plotting and their planning. And now he's just, you know, whatever, circumstances happen. I'm here because of these terrible people. But he doesn't say that. He says, I am a prisoner of who? Jesus Christ. Which means this, is he has a different perspective. All right, so he esteemed, the point, big point number one, he esteemed the unity of the church. Point number two, he had an eternal perspective. 
He didn't care what men around him were doing and how they were manipulating him or trying to manipulate him. He didn't care about the, the slander and the lies that were being stated about him. He didn't, that did not define who he was. That did not define the circumstances of his life. What defined the circumstance of his, of his life is he had a different perspective. The perspective is, I've got a king, and his name is Jesus, and he rules and he reigns. He is sovereign over the world, and he has allowed me to be in jail. Oh, that changes everything, doesn't it? Because if I think I'm enduring something because that brother right there set me up, and I start grinding against him in my heart, and I start getting upset, oh, the way I look at the circumstances is I am not one that's now esteeming the ministry the Lord's given to me. I'm mad at him. He's the guy. Oh, my ministry would be so much better off. My family would be financially better off if it wasn't for her. She took advantage of it. She took our money. She took that job. And so now I'm in these circumstances because of the government. I'm in these circumstances because of that ministry. I'm in these circumstances because of the corrupt men in my village. You are a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Nothing goes through his, uh, nothing hits your life without going through his hand. Let me ask you something. You are holding a Bible right now. And Paul wrote many books while he was in this imprisonment. You get to read, I get to read Ephesians, because he went to jail. I don't know what he's going to say about this when we get to heaven and ask him. But is anybody else glad he went to jail? I've got Ephesians because he went to jail. i got Philippians because he went to jail. I've got Colossians because he went to jail. Could he have known? <laughs> Could he have known that me going to jail is going to result in the fact that in 2,000 years from now, there's going to be 1,500 people gathered an elder at Kenya, reading a book that I'm going to write while I'm in jail? He couldn't have known that, but God knew that. And he did realize that there's a sovereign God that's over my life. I am not a victim of anybody's doings. And if you live in a victim world and mentality, you will not enjoy ministry. You will not enjoy your walk with Jesus. You will not enjoy your family. But as soon as you throw all of that off and you say, Whatever my circumstances are, I'm a prisoner, I'm in debt, I'm sick, I'm impoverished, but you know what? I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and I believe that if he wanted me to have different circumstances, I would have different circumstances. But he's allowed me to do this. So who knows what God's doing through those hard things in your life right now? Can we just let the bitterness go? Can we quit being upset that I didn't get this and he got that. That There's a sovereign God and this is the eternal perspective that he has. And when we have the wrong perspective, I'm a prisoner because of those lousy Romans, I quit. The the title of the uh, the message is Endurance in Ministry. One of the ways I'm going to endure in ministry is by valuing the body of Christ. The second way I'm going to endure in ministry is by having the right perspective. If you have the wrong perspective, you're going to throw in the towel. But if you understand your loving, sovereign God is watching every aspect of your life, then it's great. Now, here's the, here's the thing. We read in Acts chapter 20 that he was committed to following the plan God had for his life. Now, if we would have read in Acts chapter 20 that Paul was in jail because he hit an old lady over the head and stole her purse, he didn't do that. But if we would have read the Apostle Paul beat up an old lady and stole her last, you know, uh, shekel, he could not say, I am a prisoner of Christ. He could say he was a prisoner of Christ because he said, none of these things move me. I am fully committed to following Jesus Christ. And so I'm not going to allow anything to pull me off. So he was doing exactly what the Lord wanted him to do with his life. And in following and obeying the Lord, he ended up in these circumstances. But sometimes, I'm following the Lord, but I kind of step over here. And now I'm in a little different lane right now. I've got a different attitude. I have different priorities. 
I'm valuing different things. And, and now something happens in me and circumstances begin to bear down upon my life. And as I'm no longer a prisoner of Christ. I'm a prisoner of my own circumstances. I'm a prisoner of my own choices. There is incredible, amazing freedom when you live full on for Jesus Christ. When none of the things move you. Nobody moves you off target. You are just following Jesus. Nothing is getting you off. And, and it doesn't matter what happens in your life because you are doing the last thing the Lord has told you to do. Just a couple of quick stories here. And these are experiences from my own life. They may not relate exactly to what you would experience, but I think you'll get the idea. So over in um, America, as a church, we had an opportunity to buy a radio station. And on that radio station, it does exist today, on that radio station, there was going to be worship music and Bible teaching all day long. And I loved it. Man, this is a way, this is a way for us to reach our community 24-7. So we were looking at this, and it was expensive, and we didn't have, we had enough money to buy the permission to build it, but we didn't have the money to build it. After we bought it, we had one year to get it up. And so the elders of the church, myself, we prayed, we sought the Lord. We're like, we're going to buy this. And we bought the, the permission to build that radio station. I don't, it was weeks later in America when there was a financial collapse in the housing market. It's one of the worst financial uh, times I've seen in my grown life. And so everything, oh, the, the money dropped. The, the, the tithes and offerings that were coming in the church, they dropped. We were beginning to look at like, oh, how are we going to pay for everything? There was more money going out in the church than was coming in, and I had to build this radio station. I'm like, Lord, we did what you told us to do. I mean, Lord, we prayed about this. We said, dear Lord Jesus, remember Jesus, I said this. I said, dear Lord Jesus, if you don't want us to have this radio station, then take it away. We'll be, we'll be fine with it. But if you want us to have that, then continue to give us the faith and we will step out into it. And we did it. And now there was all this financial pressure. I was so glad to know that I was following Jesus. And that it wasn't just some ambition of Troy Warner's life to have one more thing in ministry to act like I'm important, which I'm not. But if that would have been my motivation, that would have looked like a fool. That would, have been my, that would have been my doing. But that's, and there's been so many times in my life where we have stepped out. And I've said these words. I don't know if these are the best words to the Lord, but they're honest. Where I've said to the Lord, Lord, you tricked me. I prayed and you said, step out. And I stepped out and then a storm arose. You tricked me. If I would have known there was a storm, I would have stayed in the boat. But you know, the Lord is good to not tell us all of the information, isn't he? Because nobody wants to get in the storm. And so we step out and we trust the Lord. Now, you're like, well, this is a great message. I wish you would have told me this two months ago before I started walking in the flesh. And now I'm dealing with all the consequences. And now I'm a prisoner of my circumstances. Well, here's the good news. God is a forgiving God. And maybe you're dealing with some stuff in your personal life, your financial life. Maybe somebody's pregnant in here and you shouldn't be. And you've got these circumstances and you're like, I did this to myself. It's my sin. It's my stupidity. It's my pride. And so now there's no hope for me. I just have to endure it because I'm not like Paul. I can't say I'm a prisoner of Christ. I'm a prisoner of my own sin. That is not true. You maybe got there through your sin, but you can get out through the grace of God. Come to Jesus today. I mean, Ken led many people to, to faith last night. I want, I want many of you as believers to repent and to experience the grace of God in your life. And you're, you're walking around, you're beating yourself up and say, ah, oh, there's no hope for me. I've got to just bear this. There will never be another opportunity for goodness or happiness or joy in my life because I've done these things. That is not what the Bible teaches us. The Bible does not teach us that. 
It teaches us that even when we sin, that we should come boldly into the throne room of grace to receive mercy and help in our time of? Hey, you need grace when you fail. Grace is available to you. Now, if you're like, yeah, I need that grace, I'm going to go back out and do what I was doing before. I don't even know if you're saved if you think like that. Who does that as a follower of Jesus Christ? But if you're like broken and humble, and I've rebelled against you, Lord, and I'm a prisoner of my circumstances and my sin, hey, there's opportunity to come. As a matter of fact, we don't even have to get to the end of the message. Right now where you sit, you can start repenting to the Lord. You can start telling him, you're a fool, and I've made a sinful thing, but Lord, pour out your grace. Pull me out of this, and he will do this. The last point, and I may pick it up a little bit um, in the next session, but the next point I want us to see is there in verse 2. Back to Ephesians 3, verse 2. So if I'm going to endure, I must esteem the body of Christ. I must have an eternal perspective. I'm not a victim. I've got a sovereign God that's over my life. Number three, I need to be a faithful steward. And as you look at verse two, he says, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. Look at that last phrase. Was given to me for you. That's stewardship. The Lord placed something within Paul, the message of grace for the Gentiles. He gave that to him, but it was for the people he was writing to, it was for the Gentiles. And this is true of every one of us as believers. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you've been given the message of the gospel for the world, right? All of us have this. We've been given something. Like, I'm not an evangelist. You, you, you know what? You may not be an evangelist, but you still are, still are to evangelize. You still are to speak to your neighbor, to your friends, to your coworker, to, to your family, and tell them, about this grace that's been given to you, and now it's for them. I want to ask you a question. Are you willing to risk harm, inconvenience, or even death for those that don't know the Lord? You've been given life. Are you willing to be a good steward? And how about for the church? Are you willing to give to the church all that she needs? Everything that has been given to you uh, through your study, through your years of walking with the Lord, of, of raising your children, and of being a, a faithful wife, are you willing to take all that you have learned, sisters, and pass it on to the younger sister? Or are you like, ah, nobody helped me out. I learned it the hard way. And I think she's going to need to learn it the hard way too. I'll tell her a little bit of information, but I'm not going to tell her everything. That's not being a faithful steward. And in ministry, you may learn things about the word or you may learn things about leading that congregation or about being out there and evangelizing or helping to raise up other young men and women to step out in ministry. And you be careful of this thought that says, well, I'm not going to tell them everything I know. If I tell them everything I know, then where does that leave me? Well, I'll tell you where it leaves you. It leaves you as a faithful steward of Jesus Christ. That's where it leaves you. You know, in the Old Testament, God gave this exhortation to um, the nation of Israel regarding the poor of the land. And he used this illustration. He said that with the poor of the land, make certain that you have an open hand towards them. Have an open hand. Don't have a tight fist. Have an open hand. I want you to think about this. If you were to take a $20 bill and you were to walk through the marketplace like this, what do you think might happen? Somebody's going to come and take it from you, right? Because your hand is open. If you walk through the marketplace like this, well, nobody's going to take it. But you know what the problem is with a hand like this? What's wrong with a hand like this? Nothing else can be put in it. And so we got our 20 bucks that we're trying to save and we're holding on to it because we think if that gets taken, then I'll be left with nothing. And the Lord's in heaven saying, 20 bucks? 
Do you know how many, how much resources I have? You're going to cling on to this little truth, this little discipleship thing that you know and you've learned. You're going to hold on to that because you're afraid if you give it away that somehow you're going to be less valuable and less needed in the body of Christ. That is an upside down way of thinking. That is not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is open handed. Take what you need. What do I know? I, listen, I love it when I get to talk about having been a dad, being a husband, um, raising um, you know, uh, my kids up, uh, pastoring the church. I love to be able to talk and share and give away everything I know. The more you give away as a steward of the Lord, the more is going to be entrusted to you. Isn't that a teaching of scripture? Don't bury it. Don't bury that gift and that talent. Don't bury it in the recesses of your mind, holding it in your heart, unwilling to give it out and help out that young pastor. Hey, he moved a little too close to me. He can figure it out on his own. Really? Really? Jesus died to bring you together as well. Is that really what you want to have? Because I think that if you give away more, the Lord's going to pour more into your hand. Tight-fisted Christianity is not Jesus' Christianity. It's the way of the world. That's the way the world functions. Give away what you have. Jesus said it is more blessed to give than receive. Be a faithful steward of what the Lord has given to you. So in this first half of the study, we've learned this. If we're going to endure in ministry, we need to esteem one another. We need to esteem the church. I need to have the right perspective that God is sovereign and number three, I need to be a faithful steward of what he's given to me, which is give it away. Give away what you've received. Entrust it to faithful and godly men. And so, Paul, I mean, chapter three is a ministry chapter. It's all about how he ministered and the trials and the difficulties that he was going through. Now, as we move through the rest of this chapter, we're going to read about how he ministered effectively with, with God's power. And there'll be some about how to make certain that we don't lose heart. We'll pick up a few other ideas as we move along. But let's go ahead and let's close in prayer. And I don't know what's happening in your heart or life, but if you are a, that sister I was describing that's unwilling to help out those younger ladies in the church because they just got to learn it the hard way because you did? Why don't you repent of that right now? Open your hand up. Don't have a tight fist. If you're a minister, you're a pastor, you're a leader, and you've been holding back certain understandings of how to minister that you have been taught, that's been passed on to you because you're afraid that you're going to become less important, would you repent of that? Just get rid of that nonsense. That is so far from the heart of God. Would you decide right now that everything that the Lord puts in your life, in your ministry, in your mind, that you're going to pass it on and you're going to do it with joy? You're like, yeah, but I'm afraid then repent of the lack of faith. <laughs> Believe that God is generous, that he's abundant, and there's no shortage of good things that he can give to you. It may be the reason why things are so dry around your ministry is because you've been tight-fisted with the body of Christ. You've been holding out. Why should Jesus give you or me anything else if that's the problem? Maybe you are that person who is a prisoner of your own sin right now. And it was hard for you just to walk through the door. I mean, nobody knows what's going on in your life, but you know it. And you're embarrassed and you're ashamed. Come to the throne room of grace. Listen, Gentile brother or sister, I'm a Gentile too. We have access to come into the throne room of God and to be forgiven and restored. And then he doesn't put you out in the back and punish you. He pours his grace upon you. He pours his grace upon you. 
And so there may be some consequences in this life, but before the Lord, you can walk out of this room right now knowing that everything is right with Savior Jesus. And you can expect that he's going to begin to pour out his grace and his blessing upon your life again. Be broken. Be humble before the Lord. God cannot resist the broken. He's a softy. He gives in to the brokenhearted every single time. To the proud, he resists them. Amen. Amen. Our God is good, isn't he? He's loving and he's kind and he's generous. And that's who we are. We're sons and daughters of a kind, generous king. There's no shortage of supply. You have what he wants you to have, and I have what he wants me to have. Let us not make the mistake of comparing ourselves one to another. That would be carnal. Our eyes are upon our good shepherd who leads us into the green pasture and the still water. Have confidence in him. God bless you.